So let's kind of jump in and start talking about chapter number eight, which talked about workflows. And I really kind of thought this uh, quote from the chapter really kind of put things into perspective for me. It's, you know, one day, you know, you will need to bring data from the outside world into R and send numerical results and figures from R back into the world. And so I created this just one quick figure here to kind of show what it looked, what, what that process would look like. As we interact with our world, we're collecting data and we have to do some type of analysis on that, whether that be, you know, wrangling data, creating models from that data, creating visualizations from that data. But once we pull it into R, and we just do our interactive analysis in it, we have to find ways to export that analysis out to the world. And it was kind of neat how the book talked about, well, what do we actually consider is our analysis? What is it? And I think the book was really trying to talk about, or the chapter is really trying to talk about what do we actually export out into the world? And how we actually export things out into the world after our analysis is having a good workflow and process set up to ease that process for us. And so the reason why we should really care about this is two things. You really want to maximize effectiveness and you want to reduce frustration. And so the stuff that was kind of talked about in the book really, really tries to emphasize those things. And as part of a supplement to this, um, hopefully everyone had a chance to kind of look at these. If not, it's not required reading, but I still think these are two kind of really um, important pieces that I've come across is Jenny Bryan's uh, discussion on project-oriented workflows. Uh, obviously she has some strong opinions, which I'll talk about here in a second, but I kind of prescribe to those opinions as well, um, especially in my own work. And then there was a, there was a video that I posted from the R Studio Conf, or was it? I think it was R Conference in 2020 from Charlotte Gelfin. And she talked about this thing about repeated reporting. Um, and so uh, there are some concepts in that video that are going to come up again later on in, in the book, which is good. So you can kind of get some exposure and introduction to it. But like the first 10, five to 10 minutes really does a really good job of like talking about some of these project oriented workflow stuff. Um, I got a question. We talked about the data that we all kind of do an analysis on. So my question is for the group, um, do you have to do periodic reporting? Uh, are there people here that do like periodic reporting as in like a month to month report or a year to year report or something like that? Yeah, I'm producing, um, I'm producing some PowerPoint. And I have actually was a very good video because I have a kind of workflow terrible. And every time I have to touch everything just to produce always the same PowerPoint every time I run some modelization. So yeah, so no, so it was very, very useful to the, thanks a lot for the link. Yeah, I, I guess another way to put it is maybe not periodic reporting, but um, maybe you work with clients or maybe you know you, you produce reports that are kind of similar like the same thing over and over again so it is, does anybody have an experience with those only only just barely um a, a, a client started asking for a report to be generated every week so so this is this is the first time um it's kind of a new customer anyway, but they, they started asking for something to be generated every week. So um, yeah, I built it in R. First thing I've ever built that's actually gone back out into the world. Um, so, and, and it's only like, I've only done it one week. So, so uh, maybe next week we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so, uh, and I think this kind of speaks to that, you know, this chapter really, I thought was the kind of that, you know, reproducibility, and I, I know, I think, um, and I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to call out Monsa here, because I know you're in academia, because I used to be in academia, there's that discussion of reproducibility, being able to reproduce our analysis, and so how do we create our projects in a way so that we can actually re reproduce it, so other scientists or other people who are doing the same research as us can reproduce it um, using the code and the data that we have. And um, just to kind of give you a little background for me, one thing that we do at, at my current job is we do a lot of monthly reports. And 
we're transitioning into doing like dashboarding and everything like that. But to first get everything kind of initially set up, we do kind of month to month reports and we've kind of created like just this project workflow where we can just take in the data, ingest it, process it, and then report on it. And then my boss doesn't have to see that middle part of it. I can just send out a report to her every month. So, so, um, so the book kind of asks us to consider what is real from our analysis. And, and I, I, I was kind of quote heavy this time around because I thought there was a lot of great quotes in, the, in this chapter, but uh, you have to kind of think about with your R scripts and your data files, you can recreate the environment, but it's much harder to recreate your R scripts from your environment. And so I just wanted to ask the group, what did you think if you saw that quote, what did what do you think about that quote? Is there something you know that maybe that you thought about? You know, what were you thinking? What do you think of when you hear that? Hmm. So so with your R scripts and your data files, you can recreate the environment, but it's it's much harder to recreate your R scripts from your environment. So how many of you have done most of your analysis? And if you're a beginner, have done most of your analysis in your console? Where it's kind of interactive, you type it in. So when you do that, you are like creating things on your computer. But it's really, really hard to actually replicate that because you don't have an actual physical product that you can take outside of R to pass on to somebody. And so I think what this quote was trying to get at was this idea that we need to, it's really easy or it's, it's a lot easier to recreate our analysis by actually having something physical rather than trying to recreate it you know, from our minds and doing it interactive again. And so it really kind of comes down to this idea of creating well commented self contained code and projects to aid that replication. And so to facilitate this, the book talks about a couple of things that you can do right off the start to kind of facilitate this. Uh, the first thing is changing your settings to not save your workspace. And so um, how many of you have ever noticed when you first downloaded our studio and you kind of do a little bit of analysis and then you close it and bring it back up your everything's still the same. How many have had that experience? And that's yeah, and so some of us have and that's a and that's a nice feature. But the problem is, is that if you're coding something and say you there and say you just decide that you created a script and you decide, all right, I'm just going to do this kind of quick calculation in my console and then you forget about it. Well, that is no longer in your R studio. You don't have it anymore. And so if you're going through your script, it's not in your script. It's not in that thing that's physical. So that doesn't help with your replication or the replication of your analysis. And so what the book says is, well, let's just automatically forget our workspace. So when we close it, it kind of reminds us that when we close it, everything's going to disappear. And so that's kind of a reminder to us that we need to put everything into some type of script, some type of our notebook so that we're keeping a record of it. Um, so the book also talks about this kind of hotkey to also help us think about when we're actually going through our scripts or going through our, our notebooks, the command control shift F10. How many of you have used this before? Um, when you start, when you start using it, when you start using R and you start thinking about creating your scripts and creating that actual physical analysis part of it, it's a good thing to always clear your R studio and then rerun your script to see if you have everything in it. And so I'll give you a quick example of this here. I'm going to jump over to my R studio here. So bear with me here. So um, my console is up here on the upper right. And so some of us have done some like interactive stuff before, right? You've typed everything into the code here. And if you want to clear this out and basically start a new session of R, what you can do is you can hit that um, shift control F10 and it will start up a new R session and clear everything out. And everything that gets cleared out, it will clear out your environment pane and it will clear out the entire R session. And so why would we do this? Well, when we do this, then we can go back to our scripts that were that we've created, rerun our script and make sure that everything is in there that we need. 
So um, I will be honest when I when I when now that I've been using R for about four or five years, I use that command a lot. Uh, I pr I use it probably 20, 30 times a day um, just to make sure that I am logging everything in my scripts. Um, and I was actually mad. I don't know how many Mac users I have here, but if you have a new brand new MacBook, you'll notice that they got rid of the the actual. Well, they didn't get rid of the function keys, but they have a they have the um, what do they call it? The uh, it's like an interactive touch bar on top, and it you know it changes. And so now you have to hit some extra keys to get the function keys to get back up. So I was kind of mad about that. So um, Windows people, you now have something that's better than Mac has right now. So. That was one thing that made me mad. But anyways, uh, the other thing that I don't usually do, but I saw is this other kind of hotkey that was like command shift S, which is gonna rerun the entire script again. I've never used that, but if you ever wanna rerun an entire script again, um, the one thing you can do in our studio is go up to this run button up here, this kind of drop down menu and you can click on this run all and it will run your entire script again if you're, if you're a point and click person. But So um, again, the reason why the book kind of talks about this is again, to just make sure that you're keeping everything inside your code so that it's physical, so that when you create it and you come back to it or you pass it on to somebody else, you know it's there. It's something that you can pass on back into the world. So this is a good segue to kind of talk about what questions does anybody have about what we've kind of talked about here. I want to ask about Control Shift F10. So, um, if are you able to bring back your our video screen? Hopefully? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I'm trying to make sure I see what it did because it didn't clear out the console. It just okay. cleared out the environment. It cleared out all the all the variables that you had assigned. Out. So if I want to clear out the comp, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. That's okay. So I, because I, I've, I've, I've closed down our studio and then restarted it, but I've just used the, the click box, the Xbox, whatever, to close it down, and then I just launch it again. And in that case, it, it clears out the console, but it sounds like Control Shift F10 does the same thing exact same thing as restarting the whole application, except it just doesn't clear out the console. Yeah, basically. Well, it, uh, so you'll have a record in your console, right? So if you ever want to like clean up your console, you can go like control L or yeah. if you're a point and click person, you can click this little sweep and it will clean it out. Um, but I think can, the, the control shift F10 is more to kind of clear out your global environment to be as a reminder to you that if you do run your script all the way through, you're making sure that you're documenting everything in that script. So like if I did something and I'm just gonna do like X two X, oh, I can't do X, A three, you know, C states, case abbreviation, stuff like that. So now mm -hmm. I've saved stuff in there, but I this isn't technically real, right? Yeah. It's, just, it's in my computer and it's, you know, stored, but I can't pass what I did in my console to you and you can't reproduce it. Right. And so to facilitate this, I should use the shift control F10 to clear out my entire R session so that if I was checking my scripts and I run through it and it's saying, hey, we don't have this variable X it reminds me as the person who's producing this analysis to make sure I document it in my script. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. so, it, and, and it, so it, uh, it reminds you to put that line of code X um, assigned to X to, uh, to two, make sure you add that into the actual script part if you, if you really need it. Yeah, exactly. Because again, it, it's really about you know making you think what is our actual analysis, what is real, and what's real is our code and our data and our on our plots. Cool. And so, like, it's just good. So, like, if I wanted to say I had a script with all these in it and it was missing something, and I run all of it and it says, "Hey, X isn't found." That's a tip to you to say, "Oh, I, it's not really real. It's not really part of my analysis." So, good question. Yeah, cool. that's awesome. Like I said, I use it a lot because we, like I said, that reproducibility part about it, you know, and, and so I could pass it on to my team 
so that they know that it's self-contained inside that code. Um, so then the next thing is, I, the next question is like, where does our analysis take place? And uh, how many of you remember the movie Zoolander? Just a kind of a silly Ben Stiller movie. Uh, basically him and Owen Wilson, their characters were to go find these files somewhere. And I think it was Ben Stiller's like agent that he calls and he says, we can't, we don't know where these files are. We don't know how this works. And then his agent's like, they're in the computer. And so I just remember this always, the line that was, they're in the computer. It's so simple. And that's, that's the way I kind of think about it. Our, our analysis is basically the files and the plots that we use and that we create to pass on to other people and pass into the real world for people to actually use. And so that's kind of where our analysis is taking place is in those files in our computer. Um, although I kind of had a joke about it, it's a little more complex than that. So uh, there's a couple other things that we have to know about where our analysis is actually taking place. And so the book talks about paths and directories. And so anytime that you hear these terms, paths and directories, the best way to think of it is it's just the location of your files on your computer. Like where are they located? And I, I shouldn't say all computer systems. And again, I'm, I'm talking like I'm a computer scientist and know all about computers. So um, I have some strong confidence here, but there's, there's a, there's a, there should be a file directory for, for your computer system, whether it be a Mac, whether it be a Windows computer, whether it be a Linux computer. Um, Chromebook, I maybe think differently, but you shouldn't be able to use R on Chromebook. But you should have a physical location where your files are located. And so um, that file location is like a physical piece of string that says it's located in this file in this location on my computer. And so the book talks about three differences across operating systems. Uh, again, operating systems is basically, are you working on a Linux or a Mac or a Windows computer? Um, does anybody here use Linux? I, if you do, good for you. <laughs> I, I don't use it. Um, I've used Windows at work, but I, I like Mac a lot better. But um, how many Windows users do we have? One, two. Okay, so I might so I might be in the minority. Bruno, are you a Mac user or a Windows user? Linux. Oh, you're Linux. Okay. So well, you and I will be similar then. So that's yeah. awesome. Cool. Awesome. We might have to talk a little bit more. But anyways, there's some minor differences across. Um, the, when I was talking about file locations, there's differences in how file locations are represented based on your computer. So for Mac users, um, Mac users and Linux users, it uses slashes. And for Windows users, it uses backslashes. Now, um, the book says that backslashes like that are used in Windows um, are actually a special character in the R language. And so it suggests that if you are on a Windows computer and you're expecting to pass like certain things or certain files to other people, if you're referencing some file location, just use backslashes. And to highlight this a little bit, to show you why this is important, um, this actual, to get this to render in my actual presentation, I had to use four backslashes because a backslash is technically considered a special character in R. And so I'll just kind of show you that as an example here, if I can find it real quick. Or you can just take my word for it too. Uh, just take my word for it. It takes four slashes to get it to get it to work. Um, the book also talks about the differences between absolute paths and relative paths. And it, this is super important, especially if you are going to pass your analysis code on to somebody else. And so what do I mean by absolute paths versus relative paths? That's a relative path. That path is specific to my computer and my file system. So if I'm trying to, oh, can everybody see me? My internet connection is a little unstable. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, if I tried to pass some type of analysis code onto people using this type of path in my analysis code, it won't work. No matter how hard you try and find this file on your computer, it won't exist because it only exists on my computer. 
unless there's somebody else that has a Mac computer that is users, you know, Colin Berkey or C Berkey, then it would be there. But that's so that's so edge case that it 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 shouldn't be. So the book talks about using absolute paths where you aren't using the specific location if you are using file paths. Okay. Um, and then the last thing and I'll, I'll open it up for any questions is this idea of the home directory on Mac and Linux. It has a specific home directory and it's represented by what's called the tilde um, windows from what the book says, it doesn't necessarily have what's considered a home directory. So everything goes into pretty much the documents folder. And that kind of threw me off because at work, I use a window. I, well, when I was working on a physical location, I had a Windows computer. It would put everything in documents and I never knew why. And now I know why is because Windows computers treat that as your home directory. So, so this is a good segue. Um, what questions can I answer? Or what questions do people have or comments they have about where what we just discussed in regard to file paths? Yeah, I read your article um, that you shared about adult, the, the set. I, I'm totally guilty of the, the set WD or whatever it is. Um, I, it's at the top of every single file I have. Um, yeah. So my question is, how how do we the to be able to do relative path? Does it have to be at the home directory? At, on my work computer, I'm I'm not using you know C whatever the standard home directory is, right? I'm I'm using a a network um, drive folder, um, so it's not the standard. I I guess my question is how how do I in that situation creates relative paths? Good. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick poll here, show of hands. How many of you have used setwd before? I have, when I first started out, I used setwd. Well, I'm gonna, hopefully I'm gonna share something with you tonight that's going to change your life a little bit. And hopefully it's something that you incorporate because it changed my life and my workflow when I did this. Um, so that's a good segue right here. So hopefully I'll answer your question here. Uh, you can set your working directory using setwd. Uh, again, it's, it's up to you. It's your system. It's how it's your workflow. You can set it up how you want. Um, but people have strong opinions about this. Uh, if you read the piece that I gave out, it's from Jenny Bryan. Uh, Jenny Bryan is uh, one of the leaders in our community, and she's written a lot of materials, a lot of teach, a lot of um, instructional materials on using R. So you probably come across her, but she holds this very strong opinion of using setwd, where she has said on Twitter and in presentations and in that blog post that she will come into your office and set your computer on fire if you use setwd. Um, and the reason why she says that is because paths won't work for another user on another computer because my file system is going to be totally different from your file system. Uh, where I put things is going to be different where you put things. And so um, she talks about that you want to stay away from that set WD because it works for you, but it doesn't work for other people. And then the other thing too as well is, is that uh, say you get another computer in two to three years. It's, if you transfer files over, it's not going to work. Um, and then the other thing that she talks about is, is that it assumes that you just shove all of your projects into one folder. And what happens is, or one location on your computer is there's this idea of project leakage where like certain things are just leaking into other projects. Some data belongs to one project, but then there's another data set and it kind of cross references each other. And so it's just better to do what's called our, our studio projects. And uh, again, it's your file system, it's your computer, it's your workflow, you can do what you want, but I highly suggest switching over to using our studio projects because it allows you to do that relative paths that we were talking about. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share how to do that. 
Um, just as a show of hands, how many people have used the RStudio projects before? Yeah, but the issue sometimes is what I don't understand with the, the project you are going to explain is that after, do we have to have everything in what folder different? So if we work on different projects and after, how can we reuse some code? Uh, do we have to remember? Because I find it more convenient to have all my code in one folder than after to reuse. But if I use project, I have to have my code in one project. So after, I don't know where are my code. So it's, it's so yes, so if you could explain more about it, yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that. Like if you want your code to be in one location, that, that does make sense. And again, I and I, I speak of this with strong confidence because this is my workflow. I've incorporated it and there may be better, there may be other ways and better ways to do it. Um, and I'm not gonna say this is the one answer to do it, but you know, sometimes you may have to make copies. So say you have a certain type of code that you want, you have to make a copy into that project if you wanna do that. Um, but if it is code that you use across many different projects, you may want to consider, and this is going to be late, I don't think we're going to cover it in the book, but explore the idea of making a package. Um, but we're not, we don't explore that here, and I don't think it's later on the book, but that might be something to consider too, if it's code that you want to use across many different areas. But I don't know, does anybody else have any other thoughts on it? Just, I just I discovered projects. I mean, it's been a few weeks, but it seemed to be just like the most obvious way to to organize everything. And so, you know, a lot of the work that I do is in projects. Um, and so, I create a new project in R for every study that I'm doing for a customer or whatever. And so, I can go back and forth. Um, so, so that makes sense to me. And so, I'm I'm trying to think about. Um, setting working directory because you can set a working directory to that project folder, right? So if you create a project from project one and then you can set the working directory to folder one and then you change over to a new project, project two, you can set the working directory to folder two. Is that is that the idea? Is... Um... I guess I'm not fully understanding. When when you create a project in R, um, there, there's a folder. It seems like everything kind of goes into one one folder. Would it be advisable to set the working directory for that in a script to that project's folder as well? Well, you, you shouldn't have to because the project automatically pretty much sets up the working directory for you. Okay. And so you shouldn't have to set your WB for that specific script or a script. And so pretty much like any, any folders that are like nested within that directory, that, that where that project folder is, you should be able to reference it um, okay. using your file paths without doing set WB on any of your scripts. Okay. Um, so, but everything has to be contained inside of that. Um, everything has to be self-contained within that project. And then everything has to be nested within that project. Now you can still use relative paths. Like, so say if you want to reference something, so say you have just like a standard directory on your computer somewhere that you want to access code, you can still use relative paths. It's just understanding that, um, that it's no longer self-contained because it's making a reference outside of that project. And so it gets harder to pass on to somebody else or somebody else to reproduce it because they don't have that file in your system. Mm -hmm. Good question. Though. That's awesome. Um, what other questions do people have about this? So I was going to kind of walk through and, and go through how to create an R Studio project. Um, uh, I know I saw a bunch of hands for people that have showed how to do this, um, but I think it's just a good exercise to do. And so, um, and then we can kind of talk about some of the nuances of it. So this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to kind of walk along with you as well. Uh, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is if you are in our studio and you are, you are in a project, you know, close your project, um, close it. Uh, and so when you look at this, if you look at our studio up in your top right, you should see that you should have projects set as none. Um, 
And so just to kind of create a project, what we can do first, before we do that, to see what your working directory is currently, you can use the function get WD. So you can go type get WD. Um, again, my console is up here in the top right. Um, for some of you, it may be in the bottom left. Just um, know there's like that slight difference between mine and your setup. Um, and then you should see where your get WD is. And that is not correct for me. So well, get WD. Well, well, it's still doing that, but that's fine. So right now, this is basically the file path on your computer where R is looking for files. And on mine, it's looking in a project folder, and I have a specific project folder that I've set up for this book club. And that's where that's where it's looking right now um, on your computer. Uh, so let's just create an R project here. What you can do is you just click up here on this, this blue button over here, and just click on new project in the top right. And you should see this new project wizard, wizard pop up. Um, when that happens, you can just click on new directory. And you can click on new project here on the next step. So again, just a kind of a quick thing. Just go back up here in the top right on this blue cube, click new project, go to new directory, new project, and then you'll have some stuff that you're going to put in here. The first thing that you'll do is you'll give your directory a name. For me, I'm just going to name it test because um, I'm going to get rid of this project later. And then what you want to do is you want to hit this browse button. The browse button is going to open up a file explorer for you. And the file explorer is basically wherever you want to put it on your computer. Um, for me, I'm just going to put it in a projects folder that I have. Again, I'm going to get rid of it later. But um, I'm just going to dump it in here. And I don't want to put it on my website. Excuse me, projects folder, open. And then it will save it there. Um, what's nice about this is that you can open it in a new session if you want. So if you click this little radio button, it will pop up a totally new R session. If you don't click that, it will just restart the session that you're working with right now. So on this bottom left, you can click on that to open up a new session, or you can leave it be and just it will open it up in R. Okay. Everybody good there? I'll give you a couple seconds, and if anybody has any questions, go ahead and, and, and ask. This is a good segue. Uh, Tony, just a question. There are a button RM. This is to save a kind of environment repository if you install some packages and you can somehow pass it pass this to another one. Is, is that how that works? So the way I so like a, a .r environment file is that what you're talking about? Yeah, when you create a new project, there are a, a button to create R uh, Let's see, any project? Oh, this yeah. use. You yeah. know, to be honest, I am not sure what that does. If anybody wants to chime in, I'm not sure what that option does. Yeah. In, in Python, we have some kind of environment that you have. Uh, blank environment you install yeah. new packers and new libraries and you have that if you would like to reproduce that you just need to run this environment right? and i just would like to know if it's similar if anybody else i, I think i know what you're I talking have, about but yeah, I, have never, I never use but i've heard about it during the talk at um, the air conference is basically so after when you are sharing your code you could be sure that the, someone is going to use exactly the same version of the package you are using. So it's like encapsulation of uh, your own package is something I want to explore, but I just heard, but I never try and I just learn about it. Uh, I will find the ref um, during one talk at the Air Conference Studios um, in January. Oh, that's great because you can uh, I will save the compatibility, uh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will uh, put uh, I will put the link uh, of it because they were talking about it um, at the at the conference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, if you could share that resource, that'd be great. Because honestly, I, I I've never used that, and that might be an option that some people in the group might use. So definitely. Um, okay. So if you created that, now what you should be able to do is in your console, you should have a fresh new console. If you type in git wd here. 
now it should be pointing to where your project is located. And you will know that this is a project location because you have this dot our project um, system file in it. Um, so, uh, so what we can do from here, and I want to make sure I'm following my directions, is uh, so we talked about GitWD. So let's create an R notebook. How many of you have used R notebooks before? I love our notebooks. I think they're great. Um, our scripts are awesome too. I use our notebooks a lot, but let's kind of create in our notebook here. So to create in our notebook, you can click on this top left, this plus button. And here's our notebook, just open it up. There's going to be a lot of like stuff that's put into this, like this kind of like front matter stuff. You can delete all of this stuff, just highlight and delete. Um, you can read through it if you want. It will give you some more information. But um, our notebooks are great because what you can do is you can put code chunks in it. So like if you wanted to, you could type, um, you know, you can do like pros or notes up here without having to do a comment. So um, I'm just going to say this, this is an awesome, awesome notebook. So you can type like it's just like a, like a normal like Word document. And then you can put all of your code into these code chunks. And so what's nice is you can just put your code chunks in here. And instead of running the entire script, you can run individual code chunks in your R notebook. And so, um, you know, I just ran library tidyverse. Maybe I just want to look at, you know, empty cars. I can look at it from here, run it, look at empty cars. And it gives like a nice output instead of being in your console. Now it gives you kind of an interactive way to look at it in your notebook. Um, so what else is nice about this, and I don't have any data here right now. Oh, well, I can create some data. So let's just do, um, I'm going to do right underscore CSV. And if you're following along, write underscore CSV writes a CSV file to your computer and uh, empty cars. Empty cars. CSV. Oh, I got to give it a name. Sorry. CSV. Yep, there it is. So right now I have a CSV file right here. Um, so what I basically did is I just took this empty cars data set and I wrote a CSV file to my project folder. And so I didn't have to, because I've set up this project, I didn't have to specify anything in here to actually move it. Or I didn't have to specify like a, I didn't have to specify a relative path to put that empty cars right there because the R Studio project has already done it for me. Um, so what I also do with this too is, is I also create in my projects, I create like a data folder. Um, and I usually dump all of my data into the data folder is what I usually do. And I'm actually going to do that right now. More move. I'm going to put it into my data folder. And so I moved that data into the data folder. And what's nice is say if I want to import that data, and we'll talk about importing data later on in the road, down the road, but just to kind of emphasize a point, you go cars, read underscore CSV, which is importing. What's nice about this is because I have my project set up, if I'm having trouble finding my files, I can do what's called a tab out. And so what I'm basically read CSV is trying to find a specific CSV file that it can read into R and to import it. If I hit tab, it will give me my file structure. And so I can go through and find the data that I want to use using a relative path. Empty cars right there, CSV. And so this works because it's all encapsulated within that project. And now I can import that data and I just imported it. I know I went through that kind of fast. So does anybody have any questions? Have people used the tab out before? Bruno, you haven't used it yet? It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's super fantastic. And again, it goes on that concept of setting up a project and using a relative path. 
And what's nice about this is I can I could pass this file on to you. And regardless, if you had a Windows, you had a Mac, or you had a Linux computer, you should be able to replicate my analysis that I just did. And to give you an example, you know, I, I, I mentioned before that I teach a class of about 22 to 23 students. This is how I share my notes. And I know it's going to work on everybody's computer as long as they have a project set up and they put everything in the right locations um, and they have a data folder and everything. I know it's going to work on their computer or it should work on their computer. So. I, I got stuck on this is an awesome notebook. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, did you do, did you create an R notebook? So click on the plus and then R notebook. Yeah. Okay. Um, you should be able to anywhere and any line, you should be able to just write any prose that you are prose. You can write anything that you want. <clears throat> it's it, when I do that, it says error unexpected symbol in this is. You mind sharing your screen? Sure. All right, let me stop share. Hmm. Empty cars. This is. Oh, all right. Okay. So, um, so you see where you have library tidyverse. Mm -hmm. Because it's not highlighted in gray, there's an issue with that specific code chunk. Just a okay. single. Under... <laughs> Is there a way to, to just? Uh... Yeah, that's correct. There you go. Oh, you were using quotate. You were using single quotations rather yeah. than back ticks. Uh, okay. Now you should be able to run it, and it should all run for you. So. Run. run. Or you can do run all too, and it should run everything. I think. Did it work for you? No. Huh, that's interesting. Um, what's um what's below the empty cars one? Right, empty cars. Right, CSV empty cars. Oh, because you're because it's a, it's that last code chunk. You haven't closed that last code chunk with the three baskets. I'm sure there's a, a, sh a shortcut to 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 put in this. Uh... Yeah. Control Alt I, or you can go up and top up top, and then there's like a it's like a C with a plus. Yeah. Okay. And it's easier on the new um, Air Studio version, the last one. It's easier to see because you have a visual editor mode as well. Uh, I don't know which Air version. We, if you update Air Studio as well, it will be easier. Okay. And the reason why you're getting that error is because of the read underscore CSV. You have to specify specify a file location. Okay. So if you scroll down, and if you go in there and then you type double quotations inside the inside the parentheses. Right here. Yep, and then hit tab. Go inside the quotations and hit your tab key. Uh, okay. And then there you go. Yeah. And then it's, it finds your file directory. So, yeah. yeah so I, I like our notebooks, especially if you're writing like a lot of notes and stuff. Um, if you're doing like data processing and stuff, I usually stick with an R script. But if I'm like writing a lot of notes and doing analysis, I, I'm an advocate for our notebook. So. Okay. Cool. Is that helpful for people? Did, did that? Um, is there any other questions that I can help? Did that answer? I'm a huge advocate. I follow Jenny Bryan's strong opinion. I love our projects. I think they're great. So, um, again, it's your computer, it's your workflow, but I, I just think they're I think they're awesome. So, uh, so Ryan, if I could take over control again. Yep. So we're about the 10 minute mark here. Oh, okay. I think this will give us a great segue to talk about chapter nine, because it's literally going to take us about five minutes to talk about chapter nine. Um, so uh, did I miss anything for chapter eight? Does anybody have anything else that they want to talk about chapter eight or any questions that they came across with chapter eight? Go on. Can I, can oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> one, one thing that I really would like to really like to our notebooks is that everything that you write in outside the chunks, it's a R markdown format. So if you put one hashtag, it will be a title, a two hashtags will be a subtitle. 
So you have, at the end, you can have a completed report and just click it run and that's done. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So um, uh, for those who aren't familiar with our markdown, it's it's basically a way that you can render reports off of. You could you could create an entire website using our markdown. You can create an entire blog with our markdown. Um, uh, there's a there's a there's a package called Bookdown that you use our markdown to write everything in. So our markdown is very powerful, and our notebooks are using our markdown. And and I they're just I, I'm a huge advocate as well, Bruno. I think they're they're super awesome. That's why I said this is an awesome notebook. So. Excellent. So I'm going to jump over here to chapter nine here. And like I said, chapter nine is super short. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to make sure that I highlight it. So let me share my screen. Press on two, share. Okay. Can everybody see where I'm at? On two. Okay, good. Uh, so this is chapter nine. Uh, if you basically look at this, this is look at the diagram, the data science workflow. This is chapter nine in a nutshell. It's just an introductory chapter. Um, but I like this visualization. I think it encapsulates pretty much what we've done so far and what we're going to be doing here in the future. Um, we're going to be working on data wrangling, um, which is going to be importing, kiting data, and transforming data. And we'll be using Tibbles to do that. And then later on in the book, probably you know, probably a month from now, we'll we'd be doing the visualizing and communicating. Uh, some of the things that we'll discuss in it. Uh, so data wrangling, obviously we're kind of running out of time tonight, but we'll dive into tibbles. We'll talk about importing data. So that an example being with using read CSV, read underscore CSV, which we did tonight a little bit with the R notebook. Um, and then tidy data, which I'm sure Ryan will discuss reading the tidy data paper, which will be part of that. And then data transformation. So looking at different types of data. So relational data, working with relational data, working with string data working with factors and working with dates and times. So uh, that's chapter nine. I don't know if that was five minutes or not, but that's chapter nine in a nutshell. So um, I think we should save chapter 10 for next time because um, I think we're running out of time. But uh, Ryan, do you want to take over and say some final notes or ask some final questions? Um, not, not in particular, just, a, a, I guess, another welcome to Morgan. We're glad that, that you joined us and anybody else that's watching my YouTube, feel free to jump in. And then all these sessions are posted on YouTube somewhere. I don't know exactly. You can get to them through the, through the Slack. Um, but yeah, no, a uh, lot of thanks to you, Colin, for jumping in for this week and I assume next week as well. And then um, anybody else, if you'd be thinking if you want to pick up chapter 11 or one of the sessions that comes after that, that would be, that would be awesome. So um, other than that, I don't have anything else to say, except that I'm still having trouble with this R notebook. Um, and I guess if anybody wants to jump off, if we, we're good, but if uh, maybe Colin or if anybody wants to stick around and help me work through it real quick. Yeah, um, I can hang out. I haven't gotten to, to our notebooks yet in the book, so. Yeah, I can hang out. Yeah, I kind of are. Yeah, we can hang out and we can talk about it. So it probably won't uh, take too long. I'm just still getting an error on this is an awesome notebook and I'm about to change it to this is not an awesome notebook. <laughs> well, um, once you learn how to use it, you should be good to go. I, I promise. Yeah. Remove the awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Then. This is a notebook. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I guess we can, uh, again, thanks, Colin. We can let anybody drop off that wants to. And I'm going to share my screen and, and we can work through what I've got left. So. Yeah, sweet. All right, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Yeah, anybody's welcome to stay. So, like, if you're still, because I, it's watching other people, I, I shouldn't say struggle, but watching other people kind of learn how to do it is a good way to yeah. learn, too. Yeah. So, so to add in the this part with the the, the back the back ticks in the R, you said Control Alt I. Yeah, I think of it as just insert, right? Yeah. Control Alt I insert. Right, right. Okay, cool. But I, but I'm going to take that one out. But you say that that you don't need it for for this note here. Nope, you don't need it for that note. Nope. Yeah. So I've cleared out the environment and I've cleared out the console. <clears throat> but if I go and hit run, run all. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. It looks like it all ran. So what is it supposed to do here? Nothing. It, it doesn't print out anywhere? So that's basically, no. I mean, that's like if you were writing notes to yourself or you're writing notes to other people. Gotcha. Um, so like if you were interested in like a lot of people, uh, so a lot of people use this for like websites and stuff. So like have, you've seen the blogs, right? Where people like write it out and then they have the code chunk, they write out like prose. That's basically what this is doing is it's like it's writing the paragraph, putting in a code chunk, writing a paragraph. So gotcha. And what Bruno was saying is like, when you get really comfortable with our notebooks, you should be able to export this as like a PDF and stuff like that if you wanted to. But I, I haven't gotten that far, but you can do that. Okay. So if I, and this is a brand new notebook. So if I just put here, this is a brand new notebook. Actually I will, I, you can just delete all that, right? Okay, so this yeah. is a notebook. Okay, control I, and I'm going to say X is equal to one to 10, oops, one to 10. Okay, and then uh, Y is equal to X plus one. Okay, so now if I run this all, okay. So another thing too is, is you don't have to always do run all. So you see over there on the, on your code chunk on the right there, yeah. there's that green triangle that will run just that one, that one code chunk all the way through if you wanted to. Okay. Or if you wanted to as well, it's, it, you can think of it like just a, a script, like an R script encapsulated into a document. So you could run it line by line if you wanted to. Right. So if you, so if you like, you, like you normally do. So if you like put your cursor on like, uh y or six or eight and just hit enter it will mm -hmm. run that one line yeah okay all right so the other thing oops yeah so the other thing that i was going to do is um empty cars you got to include it in this though right all right empty cars. So now running all, it's nothing's going to happen to this line. This is just notes. It's going to assign an X uh, value. It's going to assign a Y value, and then it's going to print out empty cars in the in the in the notebook space. Yeah. Yep. It's a mix of text and code. So. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I don't know what was happening before when I was saying that this is an awesome notebook and nothing was happening. I don't know who knows, but um, I am now going to to uh, agree with you that this is an awesome notebook. And, I know it is. <laughs> and uh, and we'll be able to. I'm gonna start playing around with this. I think this uh, this is actually covered pretty late in the book. It's like one of the last chapters yeah. on Markdown, so I haven't been there yet, but. Um, Cool. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for it. Like I said, like with like just well, work wise and school wise, like all of our, all of our reports are written in this, and and I can share this with anybody. Like, and it works on. I shouldn't say it works on every computer, but I haven't had a com student complain as long as they have their project set up and everything set up correctly. It works, so yeah. it's 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 fabulous to share things. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Any other questions? I can hang out for more or uh, if anybody has any other questions. I'm good for now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, I guess I'll see everybody. Morgan, it was great to meet you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, see everybody. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye.